I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. Neil Armstrong, the first man to walk on the moon, was born on August 5, 1930, in Ohio. He was a quiet but determined man, holding various positions throughout his career, including aerospace engineer, U.S. Navy pilot, university professor, and, of course, astronaut. He developed a fascination with flight at an early age and earned his student pilot's license when he was 16, before he even had a driver's license. In 1947, Armstrong began his studies in aeronautical engineering at Purdue University on a U.S. Navy scholarship. His studies were interrupted in 1949 when he was called to serve in the Korean War. As a U.S. Navy pilot, Armstrong flew 78 combat missions. He left the service in 1952 and returned to college, completing his degree. He met his wife, Janet Sheeran, while in college. The couple married in 1956 and soon added to their family. Son Eric arrived in 1957, followed by daughter Karen in 1959. But sadly, Karen died of complications related to an inoperable brain tumour when she was just three years old. Following his graduation, Armstrong became an experimental research test pilot at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Many of his colleagues praised his flying skills as well as his engineering ability. When Armstrong heard that the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics was seeking applicants for its space program, he became more and more excited about the prospects of both Apollo and the chance to explore a new flying frontier. He applied and was selected as an astronaut. His experience and his temperament allowed Armstrong to excel in the Apollo program. It was no surprise that a management meeting in March 1969 determined Armstrong would be the first person on the moon. It was an achievement that would catapult him into the pages of history and forever change his life. But it was a long road to the moon full of courage, glory, drama and tragedy. Project Mercury was the first human spaceflight program of the United States and it had two goals, putting a human in orbit around the Earth and doing it before the Soviet Union. It succeeded in the first, but not the second. This was followed by Project Gemini, which achieved 10 man flights for the US between 1965 and 1966. Gemini supported the Apollo moon landing program, perfected orbital maneuvers and the spacewalk. Apollo, the program designed to land humans on the moon and bring them safely back to Earth. 32 astronauts flew missions, 24 made it into outer space, 12 men walked on the moon. Beyond the moon, the space shuttle program spanned 30 years and more than 100 launches. The shuttles allowed the US to retain its position as the world leader in spaceflight after the Apollo era. The International Space Station, a home in space, orbiting 220 miles from Earth, and weighing almost a million pounds, with an interior as big as a five-bedroom house. Many countries worked together to build it. A manned mission to Mars, the subject of science fiction, engineering, 
and scientific proposals throughout the 20th century, but since the 1960s, nearly 50% of probes and orbiters sent to Mars have failed. It began with the Cold War. At the end of World War II, even before the guns fell silent in Germany, suspicion and mistrust had defined US-Soviet relations for decades and resurfaced as soon as the alliance against Adolf Hitler was no longer necessary. Competing ideologies and visions of the post-war world prevented the Communist Soviet Union and the Democratic US from working together. This resulted in simmering tension throughout the 1950s and 60s between the two superpowers, fueled by the arms race and the growing threat of nuclear weapons, espionage and propaganda. It was only natural that the struggle between communism and democracy extended into space. For the US beating the Russians in the space race was proof of technological superiority as well as a symbol of ideological superiority. But the Russians held the early edge. July 1957 to December 1958 was known as the International Geophysical Year. Scientists from around the world took part in a series of coordinated observations of the Earth and the stars. As part of their research, they set a resolution calling for any nation to launch an artificial satellite into orbit to map the Earth. The US announced they would take up the challenge and so did the Soviet Union. To the surprise of many, it was the Russians who succeeded first. On October 4, 1957, a Soviet R-7 ballistic missile launched Sputnik, the world's first artificial satellite and the first man-made object to be placed into the Earth's orbit. Sputnik's launch caught America off guard resulting in a wave of near hysteria through the public, evoking fears that the satellite and the rockets used to power it would put the US at the Russians' mercy. Sputnik orbited Earth every 96 minutes, collecting valuable atmospheric data. It orbited for three months and travelled 60 million kilometres, a major achievement for the Russians, a major cause of concern for the Americans. The Soviet Union followed this feat by launching a second Sputnik the following month. A much heavier satellite, weighing half a ton, it seemed like the Russians were flexing their muscles. Sputnik 2 also carried the first passenger into space, a dog called Laika. Little was known at the time about the impact of spaceflight on living creatures, and Laika became an unwitting test subject. She did not survive. Fears were deepened when the launch of America's own first satellite, the Vanguard TV-3, failed in front of a live television audience, exploding shortly after launch. It was a humiliation for the United States. It wasn't until 1958, with the launch of the Explorer 1, that America managed to put a satellite into orbit. The space race was on. Explorer was launched by a Juno-1 four-stage booster rocket designed by German rocket scientist Werner von Braun, who would go on to become the key engineer in the Apollo program. The failure of Vanguard led to von Braun and his team being given the go-ahead with Explorer. Their success, an early turning point for the US. With its characteristic spinning section to stabilize the upper stages, the Explorer probe included a radiation detector, which would go on to discover the dense radiation belt surrounding the Earth. Learning from their mistakes and inter-service rivalry, and still embarrassed by the success of Sputnik, the American government formed the National Aeronautics and Space Administration on October 1, 1958. NASA was officially born. In 1959, the Soviets would achieve another first. They launched Luna 2, the first space probe to hit the moon. One month later, Luna 3 returned the first images of the dark side of the moon.
the Russians were still ahead. In April 1961, Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first person to journey into outer space, orbiting the Earth in the capsule-like spacecraft Vostok 1. Born in 1934, he began his career in a metalwork at a foundry. He was selected for further education at the technical school, where he joined the Aero Club and learned to fly. He became a MiG pilot and in 1960 was selected for cosmonaut training. During his flight in the Vostok 1, Gagarin was promoted to Major. Upon returning to Earth, he was promoted to Hero. He quickly became an international celebrity and was awarded many medals and titles, including Hero of the Soviet Union, the nation's highest honor. The US needed to respond. On February 20, 1962, now 10 months after Gagarin, Colonel John Glenn became the first American to orbit the Earth. In a flight lasting almost five hours, Glenn orbited three times. The flight was nerve-wracking. Glenn had to take over the flight manually due to malfunctioning altitude and fuel controls. Upon descent, a sensor indicated the spaceship's heat shield was breaking loose, meaning the craft would incinerate during re-entry. An anxious crowd, including President Kennedy, watched and waited. John Glenn splashed down in the Atlantic Ocean, short of the planned landing zone, but alive. America celebrated. Progress was quick. It needed to be. Often missions were moved forward when the US received intelligence that the Russians would beat them to a particular feat. The race was heated. Each country had their separate programs, rockets and spacecrafts. The US began with Project Mercury from 1959 to 1963. The program included 20 unmanned launches, followed by two suborbital and four orbital flights with astronaut pilots. Mercury laid the groundwork for Project Gemini and the follow-on Apollo moon landing program. Seven astronauts were initially chosen to pilot the Mercury flights. They were Alan Shepard, Virgil Gus Grissom, John Glenn, Donald Deakey Slayton, Gordon Cooper, Walter Shearer, and Scott Carpenter. The Mercury 7 became instant heroes in a camera flash. Some would go on to ride the rocket into space, some would become high-ranking NASA officials, some would even walk on the surface of the moon. In 1961, astronaut Alan Shepard piloted the first manned spacecraft, which was launched three weeks after Gagarin orbited the Earth. Shepard arrived at the launch pad early in the morning. He was strapped in and awaited his 15-minute flight that would see him arc out to the edge of space and then descend under a parachute into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. The launch was delayed again and again. But eventually, Shepard made his short 16-minute non-orbital flight and became the first free man into space. He was awarded a ticker tape parade and a medal from the President John F. Kennedy. It was an important step for the Americans, but Kennedy was all too aware he needed to up the ante against the Soviets and win the space race. He sent a memo to his Vice President, Lyndon B. Johnson, asking him to look into the state of America's space program. I think probably the, there hasn't been maybe enough emphasis on 
on the real goals of our program, or the first, uh, what we're trying to do on Mercury. Actually, we're trying to put a man in space so that we can determine what he, what his capabilities are, what he can or cannot do in space, so that we'll know how to design future vehicles better for the man. Because some of these days, we're going to have power plants that will enable man to go out in space and make decisions on where he wants to go and what he wants to do, much as we do in airplanes now. When we reach that stage, then man becomes not excess baggage, but he becomes a real vital, living, necessary part of this thing. Johnson concluded, we are neither making maximum effort nor achieving results necessary if this country is to reach a position of leadership. He recommended that a piloted moon landing was far enough into the future that it was likely that the United States could achieve it first. Kennedy took a giant political gamble. On May 25, 1961, he made a speech to Congress and set out an ambitious goal to land a man on the moon. Now it is time to take longer strides. Time for a great new American enterprise. Time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. To bridge the gap between the one-man Mercury craft and the three-man Apollo craft that would take men to the moon, the US needed an intermediate program to develop and test all components and procedures. The Gemini spacecraft was designed and developed by Canadian aircraft engineer Jim Chamberlain. The spacecraft was capable of making major changes to its orbit and altitude. It had a complete maneuvering system with onboard computer control. It incorporated two hatches, one for each astronaut. The design also incorporated ejection seats. In case of a launch abort, the astronauts would eject individually and parachute down. The Gemini program achieved significant milestones. The first American spacewalk was performed by astronaut Edward H. White on June 3, 1965 with Gemini 4, the second manned Gemini flight. Once in orbit, White opened the hatch and stood outside his spacecraft. Attached by an umbilical cord, White tested a handheld maneuvering unit and stayed outside his craft for a then record 21 minutes. Months earlier, cosmonaut Alexei Leonov had performed the world's first spacewalk, but internal pressure caused his spacesuit to balloon and stiffen. Leonov became stuck when he tried to re-enter the airlock headfirst. He needed to drop some of his suit's pressure to scramble inside, exerting himself and overheating his spacesuit. Thanks to more advanced technology, White did not suffer the pressure problems that had plagued Leonov. Arguably, this moment was the point where the Americans took the lead in the space race. The success of Gemini gave the US the confidence to surge ahead with Apollo. At its peak, the Apollo program employed 400,000 people and required the support of over 20,000 industrial firms and universities. But it began with tragedy. On January 27, 1967, astronauts Virgil Gus Grissom, Edward H. White and Roger B. Chafee died in an electrical fire during a pre-launch test. It was a rehearsal for launch that was meant to be non-hazardous as the spacecraft contained no fuel and all pyrotechnic systems were disabled. The astronauts were strapped into the command capsule and the hatch was bolted shut. A voltage transient was recorded with the countdown on hold at T minus 10 minutes. Moments later, a fire broke out. The crew attempted to escape, but the high cabin pressure caused by the flames made it impossible to open the hatch. The fire, likely caused by an electrical spark and fed by the capsule's pure oxygen atmosphere, took only 17 seconds to consume the entire cabin. Trapped inside the command module, the three astronauts never stood a chance. The tragedy delayed the manned phase of the Apollo project for 20 months and forced a dramatic redesign of the Apollo command module as well as procedures. This included removing all flammable materials from the cabin, correcting over 1,400 wiring problems and even replacing the spacesuits with more flame-resistant material. 
The mission name Apollo 1 was retired to commemorate the fallen explorers, and all subsequent flights would be numbered sequentially. Apollo 4 was the first test flight for the Saturn V, the launch vehicle that was ultimately used by the US Apollo program to send the first astronauts to the moon. Apollo 4 flew without a crew and was an all-up test, meaning all rocket stages and spacecraft would be fully functional on the initial flight, a first for NASA. The mission lasted almost nine hours, splashing down in the Pacific Ocean, achieving all mission goals. NASA deemed the mission a complete success because it proved the Saturn V worked, an important step towards achieving the Apollo program's primary objective, landing astronauts on the moon and bringing them back safely before the end of the decade. In 1968, Apollo 7 became the first successful manned mission in the Apollo space program and the first after the Apollo 1 disaster. An 11-day Earth orbital flight, the mission was designed to check life support, propulsion and control systems. Its success gave the US the confidence to launch Apollo 8 around the moon two months later. Apollo 8 was the first manned spacecraft to orbit the moon and return safely back to Earth. Astronauts Frank Borman, Jim Lovell and William Anders orbited 10 times in 20 hours and became the first men to see the Earth as a whole planet and the first to see the far side of the moon. When Apollo 13 launched in April 1970, it was nine years since the first manned space flight and almost a whole year since the historic moon landing. Auto sequence initiated, Frank. Roger. Flight booster. Go. s 4 b pre-press complete. Roger. Flight booster. Roger. Ignition flight. Roger. Roger. Clock start, flight. Roger. Press is go, all in it. Roger. Okay, battle has it look. Looks good here, flight. Good agreement. Okay, booster, how do you look? That's what he looks good, flight. Okay, Capcom, we go beyond the ground. Okay, we're go at once, Capcom. Get really the flight. Roger. Booster, how do you look? We look good, flight. We're go. Okay, battle. We're go, flight. Looks good here. The flight began seemingly routine and calm, but 56 hours after launch, a chain of events caused by an electrical fault led to a catastrophic explosion in the spaceship service module and the loss of most of its oxygen supply. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. We've had a main B bus undervolt. You see an AC bus undervolt there, guidance? Or, uh, we may have had an instrumentation problem, flight. Roger. And we had a pretty large bang associated with the um, caution and warning there. The undamaged lunar module became a lifeboat for astronauts Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes and Jack Swaggart, and their only hope of survival. The evacuated command module was shut down completely, something never considered before. It raised many questions and concerns as to whether the systems could be restarted again in flight. Mission Control needed to perform a miracle to save their astronauts. It was quickly decided to make a slingshot return to Earth, or a free return trajectory let the spacecraft swing around the moon and slingshot back towards Earth. But more problems followed. Carbon dioxide levels in the lunar module were becoming dangerously high. Soon, the air would become lethal. Special devices called scrubbers, which contained filtered canisters that cleaned the air and removed the carbon dioxide, were running out. The command module contained more scrubbers. The problem? They were of a square design the lunar module canisters were round. In one of the great feats of NASA engineering, they had to make a square peg to fit a round hole. On the ground, an adapter was fashioned from materials the crew had available in the LEM. Cardboard from a checklist, plastic bags, and tape. After checkout in an environmental chamber, the directions for construction were sent up to Aquarius. 
At this point in time, I think the uh, partial pressure of carbon dioxide was uh, reading about 15 millimeters. And we constructed two of these things and put them on line, and I think within an hour, the uh, partial pressure of CO2 was down to two tenths. Rounding the moon, the module's engine was employed once again to increase the spacecraft's velocity for the return coast. The crew had now to wait in the cold and dark conditions with little communication from the ground, little water and cold rations. Apollo 13 successfully returned to Earth and splashed down in the Pacific Ocean. In early 1977, a fascinating silhouette appeared at Edwards Air Force Base in California. A Boeing 747 was rolled out to the runway. Affixed to its back, a new kind of spacecraft, the reusable space shuttle. The space transport system, STS for short, was to be a great leap forward in space transportation. It was a reusable launch vehicle that could carry large payloads to orbit, then return to Earth as an unpowered glider, where it would be quickly turned around and readied for another flight. The shuttle would become the most advanced and complex machine ever built. It would be a two-stage vehicle. The shuttle, with three main engines, fed from a large external tank, which had strapped to it two solid reusable rocket boosters. Columbia was the first shuttle in NASA's orbital fleet. Piloted by astronauts Robert Crippen and veteran John Young, the first flight launched on April 12, 1981. The shuttle performed exactly as had been predicted by computer simulation. The following year, operational flights began. The space shuttle fleet was used on a total of 135 missions from 1981 to 2011, all launched from the Kennedy Space Center, Florida. Major missions included launching numerous satellites, interplanetary probes, the Hubble Space Telescope, conducting space science experiments, and later constructing and servicing the International Space Station. But tragedy did occur. In 1986, an external tank ruptured and disintegrated on the Space Shuttle Challenger. The shuttle broke apart over the Atlantic Ocean only 73 seconds after launch, killing all seven crew members. One of the duties of space shuttles was servicing space stations. A space station is a spacecraft capable of supporting a crew, which is designed to remain in space for an extended period of time and to which other spacecraft can dock. The Russian space station Mir is the most famous. Mir soared as a symbol of Russia's past space glories and her potential future as a leader in space. It endured 15 years in orbit, three times its planned lifetime. It outlasted the Soviet Union that launched it into space. It hosted scores of crew members and international visitors. It was the scene of joyous reunions, feats of courage, moments of panic, and months of grim determination. It suffered dangerous fires, a nearly catastrophic collision, and darkened periods of out-of-control tumbling. After more than 86,000 total orbits, Mir re-entered Earth's atmosphere on Friday, March 23, 2001. Today, the enormous International Space Station orbits the Earth, a joint program between space agencies in America, Russia, Japan, Canada and Europe. Plans for what would eventually become the ISS were announced in 1993 by both American and Russian governments. The station is a combination of three national space programs, the Soviet Mir-2, NASA's Freedom, including a Japanese science laboratory, and the European Columbus Space Station, which for various reasons failed to materialize, instead becoming absorbed as part of the ISS. The assembly of the International Space Station, a major endeavor in space architecture, began in November 1998. The first segment was launched by a Russian proton rocket. 
It provided propulsion, orientation control, communications and electrical power. Components and modules were continuously added to the station until completion in 2011. Many components required manual installation by the astronauts during spacewalks. In all, it took over 1,000 hours of spacewalk activity to install more than 150 additional components. The station is divided into two sections, the Russian orbital segment and the United States orbital segment. Ownership and use is shared by many nations and established by intergovernmental treaties and agreements. The ISS is the ninth space station to be inhabited. It consists of pressurized modules, external trusses, and solar arrays. These arrays turn sunlight into electricity, allowing astronauts to operate the station, conduct scientific experiments, and to live comfortably for months on end. Robotic arms are attached outside. They help to build the station and can also move astronauts around on spacewalks and control science experiments. Expedition 1 was the first long-duration stay on the International Space Station. The three-person crew stayed aboard the station for 136 days, from November 2000 to March 2001. During their mission, the crew activated various onboard systems, unpacked delivered equipment and hosted three visiting space shuttle crews. It was the beginning of an uninterrupted human presence on the station, which continues to this day. 12 years and counting, surpassing the old record held by the Mir of almost 10 years. The ISS serves as a microgravity and space environment research laboratory in which crew members conduct experiments in biology, physics, astronomy, meteorology and other fields. It provides a platform to conduct scientific research that cannot be performed in any other way. While small unmanned spacecraft can provide platforms for zero gravity and exposure to space, Space stations offer a long-term environment where studies can be performed potentially for decades. The station is also suited for the testing of spacecraft systems and equipment required for missions to the Moon and Mars. It also allows scientists to study the effects of prolonged life in space on the human body. Due to the complexity involved in engineering an interplanetary journey and the millions of variables that cohere with every mission, the exploration of Mars has experienced a high failure rate. Roughly two-thirds of all spacecraft destined for Mars have failed before completing their missions, with some failing even before observations could begin. Still, manned missions to Mars have already been proposed. In 2010, a bill was signed in the United States, authorizing manned missions to Mars by the 2030s. Hope buoyed by missions to Mars that have succeeded, even missions which have met with unexpected levels of success, such as the twin Mars exploration rovers, operating for years beyond their original time frames and goals. There have been four successful Mars rovers, Sojourner in 1996, the twins Opportunity and Spirit in 2004, and the latest, Curiosity, much larger and more advanced than any other rover. This MSL rover called Curiosity actually is the most complicated, most complex and most capable system ever put on the surface of another planet. In fact, it might be the most complex interplanetary explorer that we've ever developed. The challenges of building something like that with all the parts that are involved, all the discrete parts, all the interfaces, uh, and, and all the testing, and the ability to maintain not just the documentation, but all the drawings, the test flows, the verification items, is a very complex task in itself. Curiosity has a 2.1 meter long arm with a cross-shaped turret holding five devices that can spin through a 350 degree turning range. The arm makes use of three joints to extend it forward and to stow it again while driving. It has a mass of 30 kilograms and its diameter, including the tools mounted on it, is about 60 centimeters. It is designed with 17 high resolution cameras to look for features of interest on Mars. If a particular surface is of interest, such as a rock, Curiosity can vaporize a small portion of it with an infrared laser and examine the rock's elemental composition. If the rock warrants further analysis, Curiosity can drill into the ground and deliver a powdered sample to the two laboratories inside the rover. Curiosity was launched from Cape Canaveral on November 26, 2011. It successfully landed on Mars on August 6, 2012 after a 563 million kilometer journey.
Around 1,000 people gathered in New York City's Times Square to watch NASA's live broadcast of Curiosity's landing on a giant screen. Even US President Barack Obama witnessed the landing, calling from aboard Air Force One to congratulate the Curiosity team. Now roaming the surface of Mars, Curiosity's goals include investigation of the Martian climate and geology and to assess whether conditions on the planet are favorable for microbial life. The rover also aims to investigate the role of water on Mars and perhaps the most importantly conduct planetary studies in preparation for future human exploration. Will we get there? Certainly missions to Mars seem to be the next step after conquering lunar exploration. All inspired by the success of Apollo 11, prior to launch, astronauts Edward Buzz Aldrin, Michael Collins and Commander Neil Aidan Armstrong trained and practiced. What they were about to do was unique and dangerous and had the element of the unknown. They had to train for every conceivable situation or event. Engineers, including test pilots, abhorred the unknown. As the launch date approached, the crew were kept in relative isolation for fear of catching even a head cold. One of the most watched events of the 20th century began at Cape Kennedy, Florida, on the morning of the 16th of July, 1969. Donning their million dollar spacesuits, checking their massive spacecraft as it moved to the launch pad and the tedious fueling and countdown procedure. It had taken an extraordinary effort to reach this point. 57 humans had already flown into space. Six had seen the dark side of the moon. Now, if all went as planned, man would set foot on the moon. Pumping tons of fuel per second and generating a thrust of over 34 million newtons, the Saturn V propelled Apollo 11 to the moon. Back on Earth, the media followed every step of the way. Some broadcasting 24 hours a day, newspapers putting out special editions, radios working overtime, keeping the public informed. Apollo 11 entered lunar orbit on July 20, 1969, and after 13 revolutions, the lunar module Eagle commenced its descent to the surface. The lunar module neared the landing area in the spot called the Sea of Tranquility but there were too many boulders and craters to come down safely. They kept flying horizontally, 100 feet off the ground, scouring the moonscape for a smooth place. With fuel running out, Mission Control was concerned with the safety of the crew and the success of the lunar landing. Nearly 240,000 miles from Earth and with a television audience of 500 million people, Neil Armstrong stepped off the lunar landing module and onto the surface of the moon. We're now in the approach phase, everything looking good. Altitude 4200. Houston, you're a go for landing, over. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. I'm going to step off the lamp now. That's one small step for man. One... Armstrong ventured out and away from the Eagle, finding movement in the gravity easier than anticipated. He took some photographs of the lunar lander, then proceeded to collect contingency samples of soil in case they had to make an emergency liftoff. Buzz Aldrin then descended the ladder and also set foot on the moon. 
The two astronauts then commenced their work on the surface, installing instruments and sensors. They planted a US flag and received a call from the White House. President Richard Nixon expressed the feelings of the nation and the weight of the achievement via a phone call to the moon. The astronauts also photographed everything they could, from the condition of the vehicle to the surface features and themselves. After two hours and 13 minutes, the astronauts returned to the Eagle, stored their collection of samples and jettisoned equipment they had finished with. Aldrin also left a small pouch of memorial items on the surface. It contained a message disc, a gold palm leaf and an Apollo 1 mission patch in memory of their three dead comrades. The crew then rested for seven hours before beginning their ascent. They lifted off and returned the men to orbit with ease. There they docked with the command module and transferred their valuable cargo of specimens. With a main engine burn, the pioneering astronauts were on their way home. The successful moon landing effectively won the space race for the United States. In years to come, people would look back and remember where they were and what they were doing when they heard Neil Armstrong's immortal words. Some way, when those two Americans stepped on the moon, the people of this world were brought closer together. That it is that spirit, the spirit of Apollo, that America can now help to bring to our relations with other nations. The spirit of Apollo transcends geographical barriers and political differences. It can bring the people of the world together in peace. Upon returning to Earth, the three astronauts were quarantined for a period of three weeks to ensure they hadn't picked up any unknown pathogens or microbes from the moon. Then Armstrong and the crew embarked on a goodwill tour. Dubbed the Giant Leap Tour, they were greeted and adored by millions of cheering people around the world. Many nations released commemorative stamps and awarded medals to the great explorers. In Los Angeles, President Nixon personally presented the astronauts with Presidential Medals of Freedom. Armstrong announced shortly after the Apollo 11 flight that he did not plan to fly in space again. He joined the faculty of the University of Cincinnati as a professor of aerospace engineering, where he remained for eight years. His views on space exploration were often sought and he presented speeches to his peers and the public and acted as a spokesman for several companies. All that we have accomplished in space, all that we may accomplish in days and years to come, we stand ready to share for the benefit of all mankind. As we explore the reaches of space, let us go to the new worlds together not as new worlds to be conquered, but as a new adventure to be shared. Throughout the United States, there are more than a dozen schools named in Armstrong's honor, and many places around the world have streets and buildings that honor the astronaut too. Armstrong accepted that he would always be remembered as the first man on the moon. Despite his fame, he was a humble and private man. Friends and peers described him as the consummate team player. Armstrong and his first wife divorced in 1994, he spent his final years with his second wife, Carol Held Knight, in Indian Hill, Ohio. He continued to be honored and awarded throughout his life for his accomplishments. In 1999, he received the Langley Gold Medal from the Smithsonian Institute for Outstanding Contributions to the Sciences of Aeronautics and Astronautics. So we, uh the Apollo 11 crew are enormously appreciative of being asked to receive this Langley Medal. And we do so on behalf of all the men and women of uh, the Apollo program. Some of my fellow 
Apollo crewmen who are here in, in the audience today, our, our wonderful space shuttle crews who are here, who are with us today, and many of you who, who worked on Apollo. Neil Armstrong died at age 82 on August 25, 2012, several weeks after undergoing heart surgery. His achievement and his legacy are forever cemented in history. Actually, having been somewhat surprised the fact that we were able to make a successful touchdown, I realized I had going to have to say something. Uh, but it there wasn't anything very complicated when you just think about stepping off why it seems that follows. An explorer, a pioneer, and an inspiration for generations to come.